Mike Schumacher is with us now, Wells Fargo Head of Macro Strategy. Mike, it's great to see you. What is your current thinking on what type of increase we're going to get at that March meeting? And then, you know, we're seeing yields push up a little bit this morning. That's right. Thanks, Julie. It's certainly a pleasure to be on. Yeah, thinking about the Federal Reserve at the upcoming meeting and also at the next few, we think 25 is the number. From our perspective, 50 was never seriously on the table. And the reason I say that is the Fed's number one problem is inflation. We all understand that. But whatever it does in March or in April or going out a few months beyond that, it'll take a while to impact inflation. It's probably going to be six, nine, 12 months later. So really, the Fed has to focus on what signal do we want to send to investors today? You know, going 50 basis points out of the chute, I think that signal is, hey, we've lost our grip, we've lost the handle on the situation. That's not a good look for the Fed. So we think 25 is right. Yes, the situation in Ukraine makes the inflation picture worse and tougher for the Fed, but still, we do think 25 is a number. Mike, so we could have the Fed, uh, let's say, raise rates by 25 basis points in March. We have very high levels of inflation. Uh, you have uh, Russia in, uh, invading Ukraine. How fast is the U.S. economy growing in the spring with all those factors combined? Yeah, it's putting a lot of pressure on growth. But I think, again, the inflation side is a bigger concern for the Fed. It really is a tough balancing act. How quickly do you try to slow things down? And it's an incredibly difficult situation. It was always going to be when you consider the amount of stimulus injected into the economy, both on the fiscal side and the monetary side. How does the Fed try to navigate that? So the growth picture is, I'd say it's fuzzy at best at this point. Probably need to wait for another month or two and see what the fallout is from Ukraine and Russia with respect to commodities to get a better handle on that. And on that front, in your latest note, you made an interesting point, which is that it's difficult to make some sort of historical parallel uh, for this situation and its impact on the market. So what, how do you then sort of frame it in your work if you can't find that direct historical parallel? Yeah, it's really been, it's been tough, Julie, not just for us, but I think for everyone, all of your viewers out there to think about, does this really compare to the situation in Crimea when the markets weren't really terribly off put, let's say, for any length of time, or does it map to the, the Gulf War, the Iraq War? And the answer is really none of the above. So I think you can take a look at the, the reaction on the commodity side and say, does that translate through to equities, probably to interest rates almost certainly? And that's where we've been taking our cues. We've been trying to think about the impact of this move on commodities, so pushing oil up quite a bit, making inflation worse over the next probably three to six months, and therefore getting a bit more bearish on rates. But you're right, there's just not a, a great playbook for this type of thing, so we have to improvise. Mike, have you, you and your team crunched the numbers on what gas over $5 a ga gallon nationally in the U.S., what would that do to the economy? Yeah, we haven't really worked on the pass-through from gas over 5 bucks into growth, let's say, but I, I think you've got a number of effects to consider. One is just in terms of consumer sentiment. That's about as negative as it gets. $5 gas, people don't like that. Gas goes up, milk goes up. That's a pretty big negative. And I think that puts more political pressure on, on the Fed and also on policymakers in general. So can't quantify the growth effect per se, but in terms of the, the other pressures, they become a lot more intense. And Mike, um, we got some economic data this morning. We got some numbers on inflation, on spending as well. We talked about this earlier. PCE deflator up 6.1% um, year over year, 5.2% at the core level. Personal spending up 2.1% as well, though obviously if you look at real personal spending, it's lower at 1.5%. How, how did you read these numbers? And it, it feels like, it, you know, when you're looking at the outlook for the Fed and the economy at this point, um, all of the data is sort of confirming their next move and that, that there's a certain glide path right now for the economy. Yeah, it's an excellent point, Julie. You know, we interpreted the data sort of collectively as being relatively stronger than expected. And I, I think you're right on in terms of confirmation. So looking at the PCE, the inflation data, it's from January. It feels almost stale. I know it's only been a few weeks, but so many things have happened. But still, is that really going to cause the Fed to say, hey, inflation is actually behaving better? No, I think not. And really, given the shift over the last week or two in commodities, probably PCE on top of that makes the Fed more convinced that now is the time to tighten. So it's, I think you're right that things have been lining up and generally having strong data consistently over the last six months 
makes the Fed's call, although challenging, maybe it's pretty clear it's the right one. Mike, good to see you. Hope you're well. Mike Schumacher, Wells Fargo Head of Macro Strategy, talking to us on this Friday morning. 